So I don't want to spend too much more time on this just because we've got so much to get to. But I do want to demonstrate one principle that can help us uh, with this number problem. And that principle I want to talk about is single responsibility. So the kind of goal we want to search for whenever we're coding, this is a best practice, is you want to make sure that every function we have has exactly one thing it has to do. And if we look at calculate mode right now, it has a lot of different steps because calculate mode's primary function should be return the mode from this list. But we have a bunch of other steps in between. We have converting that list into an object. Then we iterate through that object. And now we want to make sure that anything we put into our results is a number if it can be a number. So what I want to do is I want to, instead of further calculate, uh, further complicating this for loop, I want to give this, I kind of want to ship out this responsibility to another function. And I'll call this function something like convert key, because it's going to convert a key into a number if it, can, if it can be. So we can call it key. And all I'm going to say is, let's try this, if number key return number key. Else, I'm just going to return the key as is. It's a very simple function, but it saves me a lot of issue, a lot of complication because then when I get down here, I can say results.push. I can uh, push convert key key, like so. So I'm going to try running this again and see if it works. Oh, I didn't console.log anything anymore, so let's console.log. This. That looks like a number to me. And if I run the tests, fingers crossed. There we go, everything passes. So if you take a look at this function, it isn't anything different than what I tried doing when I put an if else in the for loop. But by shipping it out to its own function right here, it makes everything a lot easier to read. Because then when I get here, all I need to do is just call on that function, convert key. I don't need to have another if else inside my for loop anymore. And we could continue doing this. We could, for example, we could take this part where we convert our list into an object and make that its own function too. We could say const convert list to object takes a list as an argument. And then we could you know, essentially just copy all of this code. And then we return occurrences. And now, instead of having this line in my function, I could just say, let occurrences equal convert list to object list. So now my, func now my calculate mode function is a lot more readable because I just, how do I turn occurrences from a list? I have a function that does that. How do I turn a key into a number if it is a number? I got that too in another function. And you can find these functions easily enough by just going up here. And I'm going to test everything, make sure it still works. It does. So again, this is what we call single responsibility. And it's a very good practice to start doing now, because the more you turn your code into many small functions that work together, the more readable it will be for other people that you work with. Uh, does anyone have any questions about single responsibility and how I kind of changed up my function here? Do you typically 
write with that in mind right away or do you kind of write everything out and then start turning stuff into different functions? That's a good question. Uh, I would like to say that I start out writing a bunch of small functions, but in practice, I often find that I'll be writing one big function. And as I'm writing, I'll realize, wait a second, this section right here that I just did could be its own function. But in general, it's a good idea to start thinking of your code as, OK, how many pieces can I divide this into? Because the more pieces I can divide it into, the easier it'll be to kind of to edit and work with. And so, yes. So in your pseudocode, you can kind of say, hey, make this a function, make mm -hmm. that a function. Yeah. You can even have a step that says write function to do this. And then worry about that function later if you want. And it's especially useful if you find that you end up, if you find yourself repeating code. Like, for example, I didn't want to have to say in both of these things, if this item is a number, convert it to a number. So I had a function do that for me. Yeah, and just like a lot of times when you're writing your applications, <clears throat> you'll write a single bespoke function that's used once. And then later on in your application, you'll find like another area where that function might be you is applicable to another portion in your application, but just a little modification to that function will make it reusable in multiple areas. So that's like another, that's just like another example. Yep. All right. So I know we, it, there's still a lot of confusion with this fun, with this uh, challenge, but again, we have a lot to get to today. So I'm going to uh, quit out of this one and go on to the next one, which I believe should be, let's go to pad and array first. So I'm going to, yeah, I already forked it. I'm going to clone it. Get clone. Open it up. And this one I'm going to do in Python because Python is essentially going to be what we're doing for the rest of the week. So we have right here, let's take a look at our readme. So in this challenge, you'll want to write a method pad. It will accept a list, a minimum size of a non-negative integer for the list, and an optional argument of what the list should be padded with. See the example of Apple below. If the list length is less than the minimum size, it should return a new list padded with the pad value up to the minimum size. So they have an example here, one, two, and three, and five are the arguments. And so we have a list of length five as the return value, and everything that isn't already in the original list is now none. But we have this optional argument here with apple, so instead the list is now padded with apple. And it says right here, if the minimum list is less than or equal to the length of the list, it should just return the list. So pad one, two, three with an uh, argument of three should just return one, two, three. So we have our pad array spec. We have pad array right here. So let's write our unit tests before we do anything else. I always think that's an important thing to do. So to do that, we need to use unit test, right? So in that case, we need to import unit test. And then how do we set up unit tests? Um, you have to create functions with prepended pre by test underscore. Mm -hmm. Create functions prepended by test underscore. And then you uh, need to call uh, unit test.main in the, mm -hmm. um, I'm sorry, actually go back. Um, you need to create a class that inherits uh, unit test dot mm -hmm. um, test case. Yep. It'd be like pad array test case, I believe, is how we would, is the function, is the, Convention, and that inherits from unit test dot test case. Yep. Nope. And then the methods, as I described mm -hmm. before, mm -hmm. be like def test array, like test pad with no optional argument. <laughs> 
believe that takes self as an argument. Let's make sure I'm doing this right. Never hurts to check the documentation. You're good so far. <laughs> mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, this all looks good. And then we have assert equal, things like assert equal and assert true. So we'd want to say something like self dot assert. And of course, now we've got a thing where we talk about lists. And lists can always be a little tricky. But let's take a look at assert equal. Fail the two objects are unequal is determined by the equal equal delta operator. So let's try that. Self dot assert equal. And we should be able to say something like it's called pad array or just pad. Pad with one, two, three, and five as the arguments, just like so. And we should be able to get an array of one, two, three, none, and none. Ah, undefined variable pad. So we need to get that, right? So we can say from pad array, pad array, import pad. A lot easier. And we can try one desk pad with optional argument. Pad, and if we give it, <coughs> excuse me, one, two, three, five, and apple, we should get one, two, three, apple, and apple. And then one more to test what happens if you give it if the length is less than the original length of the of the array. <laughs> Sorry. Test return original array if length shorter. So you should say self dot assert equal. Pad with one, two, and three, and an argument of two. Oh, I forgot a parentheses in here. And it should just equal one, two, and three. So these uh, this testing suite making sense to everybody? I'm going to try running it. I believe I have green installed. I hope I do. So I do pad array. You need to check. You need ah, sorry. You need to add a main function check. Ah, yes. Thank you. Create a main file check. Mm -hmm. So that's if I always forget if under under underscore underscore name equals under underscore main. Oh, that was nice. And no, it did that automatically. We don't want to pass though. In that case, what we want to do is unit test.main. So now if I run this, I don't oh, I don't think I'm in the wrong fold. I think I'm in the wrong folder. Yeah. There we go. So I'd run green pad array spec .py. Uh oh. Ah. That's because you can't have nothing after a colon in Python. If I put a pass here, that should at least allow it to run. Yep, three failures. None does not equal this array. <laughs> OK, so it looks like our test suite is ready to go. Now that we've done that, now it's time to pseudocode. So again, looking at our uh, requirements, making sure we're all on the right page here. So we have a method pad that takes a list, minimum size, and an optional argument of what it should be padded with. And we, the re end result should be a list of the length of size padded with the pad value or none. 
So we already got the first step. Define function pad that takes array, min size, and optional value arguments. So taking a look at our requirements, there's one step we can, can kind of knock out of the park right away without really having to go through any logic, right? Just, I mean, I'm thinking compare sizes. Yeah, because if we already know that if the minimum size is less than the length of the array, we just need to return the array and we're done. So we can get that out of the way right now. We could say if, a, you know, if min size is less than array length, return array. So that's one requirement already out of the way. Else. Uh, Nick, uh, no, I think you chose uh, greater than. Oh, thank you. All right. If that if that's not the case, then we actually need to get the logic going, right? So, what's the next step? Calculate the difference. Calculate the difference. Yeah. So, else, calculate difference between min size and array length. And then what? I created a, a list of the uh, value. Um, that's the size of the difference. And then added it to the original array. So we can create a second, uh, a second list that has that, uh, that has the value. And if not, then we can, it, and then we can con essentially concatenate it onto the original array and return it. Is, am I reading you correctly there? Yes. Great. So create second array of difference size <laughs> full of value concatenate second array onto first array return new array. Does that seem like a you know good number of steps for everybody? I think so. So before I continue with actually starting this, I want to talk about this thing right here, value equals none. So they keep on talking about how there was an optional argument here. So based on what we're looking at here, how do you create an optional argument in Python? Just like that, right? Yep. They have to come after um, required inputs. And then you have to declare them with an equal sign and a default value. Exactly. So when we say value equals none, what we're saying is this function pad has to have array and min size in that order. But value, we're saying it can take value as an argument. But if it doesn't, if we don't give it one, it has a default value that it adopts right away. So if we don't, so you know, kind of looking at our examples here. In this one, we give it one, two, we give it five as, so here's our array. Here is our, what did we call it? Min size. We didn't give it a value, but we still need one. So value defaults to none because we told it to. But here we have that third argument. So value, that step of assigning value to none will be skipped. Is that a, like, does that, uh, you know, does that pass the smell test? Does everyone see how that works? Okay. So in that case, let's uh, get our first step out of the way. Just say, if the min size is less than array length, return array. So, and actually I'm looking at this now. We have our calculate difference between min size. We can kind of combine these steps a little bit, right? We can calculate the difference. And if this is less than or equal to array length, I should say. So if the difference is, this would be, if it's zero or less, then we can just return that, right? 
So I could do something like difference equals, so this would be min size minus len of array. So if the min size is greater, it should be a positive number. If it's less than or equal, if it's smaller or if it's the same size or smaller, it should be zero or less. I could say if difference is less than or equal to zero, return array. So if I run my testing suite again, I should have one test passing. Yep, two failures, one pass. So that's one test passing, which is great. So we could put an else here. We also don't have to because once it hits a, re a return statement, it'll still, it'll stop running. So now we need to create a array of size difference filled with none or value, whatever, or value, whatever it is. So what's the most efficient way to do that? Uh, list multiplication. List multiplication. So could you elaborate on that, please? So if you create a list uh, with a, a value as its single item, you can multiply it and it would multiply that item that multiple times. Mm -hmm. So for, so what you're saying is if I said something like, let's say new list equals, and then we could have a list like here with value times difference. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Let's try that out. Make sure it works. Print new list and let's, uh, have some runner code here to test it out. So pad one, two, four. So we, uh, so if this is working, we should have this print statement should show us a list with two, uh, with two nuns in it. Oh, right, need to actually run it. Python pad array.py. All right, that looks pretty good. And if we give it that extra argument, I don't know. We now have ribbon instead of none. All right, good. So now we have our two lists. One is the original list. One is the list filled with our values that we want to concatenate onto it. All right, so to concat the, concatenate those two lists, there's definitely a Python method to do that, right? Let's look that up. So I'm gonna say Python concatenate lists. So Python, join two lists. This looks perfect. One of the easiest ways are by using the plus operator. So we can actually literally just add lists together like they're numbers. So, Perhaps I could, it could just be as easy as return array plus new list. Do you think that's going to work? Yes. Let's take a look on our testing suite. Three passes. All right, cool. Uh, what questions do you have about this? So for, for Python, optional stuff equals none, optional parameters equal none. Um, my understanding is JavaScript, you're gonna have to actually go in and do some manual checking. Yeah, well, let's check this out. So I should, if I just Google JavaScript uh, optional arguments, optional parameters, how to declare the optional function parameters in JavaScript. Yeah, that's what I got too, pretty much. Yeah, so we can use the logical or operator is one way to do it. So we could say essentially function A or B, and then you can say B equals B or zero or whatever default value you want to put. So it's a one line thing that's pretty simple. So these double pipes mean or, and all we're saying is, okay, we're assigning this variable here to either whatever whatever's here, if it's the, if it exists or the default value. 
But it looks like here, we can all say, in this approach, the optional value rule is assigned the default value in the declaration itself. And it should always come at the, uh, come at the end of the parameter list. So it looks like right here, they do b equals zero. You could also do b equals uh, null. So it looks like JavaScript, we could use the or operator, but we can also use this equal thing in the function variable declaration in the, very, in the parameter declaration, just like we did here. And let's see what it says. And they actually ha have done it, done it for us, value equals null. So JavaScript, we can use that or operator, but we can also assign default values the same way we did in Python. Thanks. No problem. What other questions do you have about pad array? Okay, in that case, let's move on to balance brackets, which is the fun one. I know you've all been looking forward to this. Gonna clone it. I also realized I should have been putting these in week one. Oh well. All right. So these IDEs are running something similar, right? I'm sorry. The, these IDEs, they're running something similar when they're checking your um, your inputs while you type? Yes. All right, so Probably let's way take- way faster than what we wrote. <laughs> <laughs> it's a lot of practice for the most part. <laughs> so let's take a look at our readme. So we want to write an algorithm that takes in a string and returns a string with balanced parentheses only. The string will contain letters, numbers, and parentheses only. So we don't need to worry about other symbols or data or like other kinds of brackets. So in this case, so the examples they have, so we have a balance, these parentheses are already balanced, so it should return it as is. Same thing with this. And this one should say, okay, these two are balanced, these two are balanced, but this one isn't. So it returns the, a, a modified version of that original string. So the idea is we want to make sure that we return the string without any brackets or parentheses that don't have a matching one or are in the correct order as we see like with this one or this one here. So I know this is a tough one. It's meant to be a tough one. Sometimes we give you challenges that are designed to really push you to the limit. Uh, so what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna go over uh, one solution that I did in Python I know there's like dozens of ways to tackle this, but I also wanna make sure we've got time for other things to do here as well. So in this case, they didn't give us any files, so I'm gonna make one. So I'm gonna do this in Python. And just in the interest of time, I don't, I'm not going to do a testing suite right now because I wanna get as much of this done as I can before we move on to our main topic for the day. So I'm gonna start pseudocoding this out. So write a function called balance. Is that what they wanted? Yep. That takes a string as, an as a parameter. And I know down here I wanna say return balanced string. We need to figure out what to do in between then. So we need to like taking a look at like an unbalanced one, for example, we can, have, we can make a few assumptions here. I know I'm gonna have to loop through this string and check every character individually. And I do know that if it's not a parenthesis, a parens is the word, I can just ignore it. So I only really need to worry about these guys. And I'm thinking through my logic. If I see a left parens, I should be able to say, okay, we have one left parens 
and that's fine for now. And we only need to like worry about getting rid of it if it doesn't have a right parens to match it. So I'm like, so I start here. I go, okay, I got a left parens, making a note of that. Not worrying about the coding logic yet. I have an A. Okay, great. The A is fine the way it is. And then I see, okay, I've got a right parens. These two match. I don't need to worry about them anymore. They're perfect the way they are. Left parens. Okay, taking a note of that. B, D, D, don't need to worry. Oh, this one matches this one. Great. So then I go to here, C, don't need to worry about it. And then I see this right parens. There isn't a matching left parens that I've noted. So now that I've gotten to the end, I've got one right parens that I need to get rid of. And kind of looking at another example, for example, this one, going through it. Oh, there's a right parens. All right, we know that uh, there's no matching left parens. We already know that that's not right. Going on, we've got a left parens, and then we get to the end of the string, no matching right parens. So we need to get rid of both of them. So I'm going to go through that first step, which is loop through string. And we could say if character is left parens, we need to make a note of that. I'm not going to worry about exactly how just yet. I just want to get the general idea into writing. If character is left parens, make a note. If character is right parens, and then inside of that kind of say, if there is matching <laughs> left parens, leave alone, I suppose. You know, else make a note. Then we want to say, after we've looped through everything, remove all non-matched parens. And then return the balanced string. So. I know this is very, very vague pseudocoding because I'm kind of starting from a very, very kind of confused assumption here, assuming I'm coming in going, okay, I don't know exactly how to do this yet. But does this logic check out to everybody, more or less? Did anyone take a different approach? Yeah, I, I would a check the approach. I, uh, first I looked for the clo the closing parenthesis and then I looked for a uh, correlating opening parenthesis and I marked those. So it's probably the same thing, just uh, done it in a different order. Okay. And I heard someone else talking. I looked for the right parenthesis first and then I looked it back through and then closed it out and ran it back a second time. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, one other, I guess, approach would be, I guess, between your, uh, I guess, as part of um, uh, line five, instead of leave alone, I'm assuming you're, you're referring to just the right side of things, but I, I went through and I deleted it from the left note. So if you made a, a note saying there's an open left, if there is, you know, so on line five, if there's a matching, it's pretty much everything exactly like that, except instead of skipping it and not doing anything, I also went back and remove the note. Yep. So these are all good approaches. And again, I don't have time to go through all of them. So I'm just going to go through my approach. And to do that, I'm going to be kind of making use of a, technically it's, they're just arrays, but I'm going to be using them in the same way one would use a different data structure. And I'm going to get to that in just a bit. First, I'm going to write my function that takes a string as an argument. And what I want to do is I want to, in order to keep track of my parens, I'm going to be making use of a data structure called a uh, stack. Has anyone heard of stacks before? It's okay if not. Has anyone not heard of stacks before? I haven't heard of it before. Not like a stack or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So a stack is, uh, works a lot like an array, except for one major difference. So an array, you can just add things in any order and remove them in any order. A stack works a lot like a deck of cards. For example, so this is going to be tough on webcam, so bear with me. 
I add one card to my stack. I add a second card to my stack. I add a third card to my stack. I can't, I can't add these in a different way. I have to add them one at a time. And the only one I can remove is the top card. So this is what we call a last, a fir, uh, would be, is this last in, last out? I always get these confused. First, first in, last out? First in, last out. So uh, LIFO. Yeah, LIFO, last in, first out. So the last thing that can be added is the only thing that can be removed. And Python doesn't really make use of stacks as their own thing. So what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be making an array and essentially treating it like stacks. And I'm going to demonstrate that right now. So I'm going to be making two different stacks, one to keep track of my left parens and one to keep track of my right parens. So I'm going to call this one left stack and right stack. I'm going to start looping through my string. So I believe you can just do that in Python. You can just say for char in string. And I want to say, all right, first off, if char equal equals a left parens. If it is, I'm going to add it to my left stack. I'm going to say left stack dot append. And actually, now I'm thinking about it. I don't need to keep track of the parentheses themselves. Because the parentheses themselves are just saying, OK, whether or not they should be added to the final string. What I really need to keep track of is the index number. So maybe I should make this an enumerable one or enumerate. So I believe that would be for index char in enumerate string. Is that how you do it? Yes. Mm -hmm. So if I encounter a left parens, I'm going to add that index number to my left stack. So full transparency here, Noah. I didn't yes. even get to this because I'm not that fast. No worries. But can't you just assume if you run into a right parens mm -hmm. before you run into a left, it needs to go and do the opposite from the right hand side? So we can do that. So we can say, OK, but then we would have to say, all right, you know, looping through our string, running into a right parens, and then we need to go back again and look for a left parens and assume that there's a uh, and we'd have to check for edge cases like, OK, uh, if there's things in between them. Like if we take a look at this guy right here, these two aren't balanced, but these ones are. But this right parens is matched with this left parens over here. So that's a little bit trickier. So what my, my logic here is, at the end of this, I want to, if it's a balanced string already, I would assume that there would be nothing left in my left stack or my right stack. Because every because what I'm going to get to is every time I encounter a right parens, if there's a matching one in the left stack, I'm going to remove it. But and not add it to the right stack. I'm only going to add right parens to the right stack if there isn't a matching left parens. And at the end of this, I'll have a I should have lists of any index numbers that aren't matched is the idea. I know this is hard to visualize. I'm trying the best I can to you know, take this slow. So let me know if I'm going too fast, please. No, I, I'm, I'm tracking. OK. So now I'm going to say elif char equal equals a right parens. So now what I need to say is, all right. If I need, need to write parens, first I'm going to check, have I already tracked any left parens? Because if, if there is one there, it means it's matched. So I'll say if len of left stack is greater than 0, so that means there is one there. That means that I don't need to keep track of the index number of this right parens, because it can stay. 
And I know that the, any, the left parens I found here can also stay, so I can remove it from my left stack. And because this is a stack, not just an array, I'm going to remove the last one that got added. And there's a method that to do that called pop. So I say left stack dot pop. And uh, pop just removes the last thing in the array. Like if you were having a pot of peas and just squeezed it, out it goes. It, it, it also returns it to that line. Yes, it also returns it. But I don't really care what that index number is, so I'm just kind of letting it go and not worrying about what gets, not saving it to a variable or anything like that. So that's what happens if there is something in the left stack. If there isn't anything in the left stack, then I'm going to add right stack dot append index. So I'm going to kind of stop right there a bit and I'm just going to say I just want to take a look at what these look at look at at the end. So I'm going to say print left let's do this. So left stack left stack and then right stack right stack So I'm going to run this on one of my examples. So I'm going to say balance. And for something like this, I'm, I should expect both stacks to be empty because it's already balanced. Uh, the last character is unbalanced. Oh, you're right. There we go. So this one right now has already has balanced parentheses. So I should see two empty stacks. Left stack is empty, right stack is empty. If I add this stray right parens, right stack should have the index number of that lonely parens. There it is. Now if I do something more extremely unbalanced like, nope, let's try. Something like this, my left stack has zero, one, and two, because all of these are unbalanced. And if I add one right thing to this, I can see that I saved zero and one because they're unbalanced, but then I noticed that this last one I added was, so I removed it from my list. Would counters work rather than set? So yeah, I want to make sure that I'm only getting the uh, last result. The last, like I said, stacks are Last in, first, last in, first out. So the last thing to be entered the list is always the first thing to come out. And then if I add another one of these right here, I should only have one unbalanced thing on the left. Is that uh, you know making sense so far? Okay, so I've got, so essentially what these two lists are giving me are the index numbers of everything I want to remove. So once I've done that, I want to build my string. I want to make sure that I am only doing that without those, all, without the characters at those index numbers. Does anyone know a super easy, fast way, to, one line way to do that? Because I don't. Because whenever you remove something from an index number at a string, everything gets shuffled and then all your index numbers get changed. Well, you can um, sort backwards. So go to high or low. So go that the index number doesn't change for the next thing. Mm -hmm. Sorry, say it again. If you, if you remove from high to low ind indices, then uh, while you iterate, the indices won't change. Uh, possibly, but I think there's also a chance that, yeah, if I'm only removing the high ones, but they don't necessarily, they don't necessarily be concurrent. 
And so if I like if I'm removing the last one, but then two ones after that, well, hmm. Actually, maybe you're right. Sorry, thinking about that. I guess you could insert a placeholder and come back and filter it out later. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I, I think you're right, but I also have a, w a way in mind, and I don't want to struggle through trying to right, figure yeah. something else out that I don't already know in this case. Uh, but I'm sorry. I, I think I just interrupted somebody. Yeah, uh, at this point here, you'd want to, um, I guess, because you, you're left off, you got a left stack and you got a right stack. You want to go ahead and combine those stacks together and then sort it in reverse order, like he said, and then you can pop them off or remove the index uh, after uh, you combine both your left and right stack. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we can definitely uh, combine our stacks because once we know, once they're, we're done through this process, we only really need one list of all the index numbers we need to remove. So we could say bad indices <laughs> equals left stack plus right stack. And then we could say, let's see, bad indices equals bad indices dot sort and make sure I'm doing sort correctly. Does the zip command in Python merge duplicates or does it? That creates uh, a tuple of two different lists. Yeah, but in this case, I don't think we need to use zip because we shouldn't have any uh, doubles here. So, okay, there's also sorted list key equals. So let's try sorted. That seems like it may be good. how to sort in descending order. Ah, here we go. So it accepts a reverse parameter as an optional argument. So we can just say reverse.true. Okay, equals root true. So we could actually just say bad indices.sort reverse equals true according to this. So just to make sure it works, I'm gonna print bad indices and make sure I get like a real unbalanced one so we can so our left stack is 0, 3, and 4, and now we've changed it to 4, 3, and 0. Let's add, make sure we have at least one in the right column just to double check. There we go. So now we have 1, 4, and 5 in the left, uh, in left parens, 0 on the right parens, and then we've sorted it 5, 4, 1, and 0. All right, great. So now we've got that. Now we need to actually uh, make sure we remove everything from those indices. So let's see, what's the best way to do that? Like, so we can just do a Python, remove character from string by index. So we have slicing. So one important thing about Python is strings are immutable. You can't modify the original string. So what we want to do is we want to return new string objects instead of modifying the original. So they have a sample string right here. And you can say string object, and we, they have a way of slicing it. I don't like this version. I don't like this tutorial. I'm gonna just do Python slice. create a tuple and a slice object. Use the slice object, you don't need to first. So it returns a slice object. A slice object is used to specify how to slice a sequence. You can specify where to start the slicing and where to end. So we can say, start here. So in this case, we may need to do a lot of different slices at all these other indices. So, Another way of doing this, if we don't want to have to worry about these, uh, about, you know, okay, make sure we get a slice, is we can also just build a new string from scratch. And what I mean is, I'm going to do something like this. So return string is going to equal em an empty string. And then I want to say something like, okay, I'm going to do another loop 
just like I did here of, I'm going to say for index and char in enumerate string. And what I'm going to say is if index is in bad indices, actually it's, we want to check if it's not in bad indices. So it'd be, can we just do not in bad indices? Is that how that works? Yep. Mm -hmm. So if, so we're going through our original string right here and checking every index and just saying, okay, if it's not a bad index, we can add the char to our return string. Return string plus equals, actually, you can't do that with Python, right? Because they're immutable. No, you could do that because you're returning a new variable every time. Oh, right, yes, thank you. Because what I'm saying, it's the same thing as saying return string equals return string plus that. So return string plus equals char. So if I print return string here, I should hopefully see a balanced string. That looks pretty balanced. Let's try it with some of the examples they gave us. So A, B, C, and then should just have should remove that last one. And so I should just see A parentheses, B parentheses, C. So obviously I would, in normal circumstances, I would want to write a test suite for this, uh, but this is such a complicated one that I just wanted to get right to the, right to the challenge. I'm try this one right here. And then one more, I just uh, want these guys. And this should return an empty string because neither of these are balanced and there's nothing else. Yeah. So it looks like this way worked. So I understand that this is a very complex problem and I know I kind of went through it very quickly. Uh, but uh, what questions do you have about how the solution has worked? I will post this code in Slack as well, just so you can take a look at it at your leisure. Because I know, I think at this point I can tell that some people's brains are hurting and that's okay. This is, again, we're drinking from the fire hose here. So let's take a, let's take a six minute break, be back here at 1031 and we'll start something new. Sound good? Okay. All right, thank you. Want to stop recording, please? Let me stop recording.